to um, remind you to please mute your microphones. We'll be using uh, slides throughout today, so you may find it easier to be on the speaker view for this session. You're welcome to leave your camera on or off, um, and there will be time at the end for Q&A when you can turn your cameras back on, you can open up your mics at that time or certainly use the chat for questions at the end. Our series is sponsored by the Staley School of Leadership Studies and supported by a cross-campus planning uh, a committee who's listed here, many of who are also on um, uh, Zoom with us today. So thank you so much uh, to this team. The purpose of the series is to build and strengthen our community through gathering and reflecting on what matters most. We all have stories to share that reflect our values, our life experiences, hard choices, and lessons learned. So we join here today, kicking off our fall 2020 series with an acknowledgement that our world, which includes the spaces and places we live in, the schools we attend, the communities, communities that we are part of, face many challenges. The people in this room, um, are, as well as our friends, families, and our colleagues are experiencing heightened polarization, political tensions, acts of discrimination, and even violence, health concerns, relational conflict, and competing academic, family, and personal commitments. And yet, we gather and we hold on to hope, a critical hope, that through storytelling and through connection and listening and empathy and dialogue, that we can develop the capacity to see patterns more clearly, to seek new understanding of ourselves and others, and to act with courage to transform the turbulence and uncertainty that's all around us into possibility for all. This quote, which is adapted from hum the Human Systems Dynamics Institute, represents the kind of adaptive and inclusive leadership that is so needed in our world today. And we hope that this program inspires each of us to recognize the opportunity that we have to speak what matters to us and to hear what matters to others in pursuit of finding and living out our shared values and purposes. I'd like to uh, invite Delshay Roberts to give our speaker introduction today. Delshay is a first year master's student from Kansas City, Kansas, studying public health with an emphasis in infectious disease and zoonosis. She also completed her undergraduate degree at K-State, receiving a BS in biology last May. Thank you, Delshay, for joining us today. Good afternoon, everyone. As Carrie mentioned, my name is Delshay Roberts, and today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ella McCahey. Dr. McCahey is an associate professor in the Department of Diagnostic Medicine and Pathobiology in the College of Veterinary Medicine here at Kansas State and the director of the K-State Masters of Public Health program. Dr. McCahey earned her Bachelor's of Science in Microbiology from University College Cork in Ireland. She then completed her graduate studies at Creighton University in Nebraska and earned her PhD in microbiology in 2003, working on prion disease in the model of prion protein conformational change. She completed postdoctoral work in viral neuroinvasion and went on to complete an MPH in 2006 at the University of Kansas Medical Center, where she developed health educational programming for women refugees and their families. Dr. McCahey came to K-State in 2016 to take up the position of the MPH director. She has taught at the undergraduate, graduate, and professional level plus taught continuing education for several programs and professions, including public health, nursing, medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, and veterinary medicine. Dr. McCahey has also been recognized with several awards for her teaching and service, including the 2010 Case Kansas Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. I would now like to introduce to you all Dr. Ellen McCahey. Thank you. Thank you, Del Shay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and then we can get started. If my mouse will cooperate.
Okay, that took a little bit. Okay. All right. So thank you, um, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, and thank you to Carrie and Del Shea for those introductions. And also thank you to the committee for asking me to give uh, a lecture in the lecture series, uh, What Matters to Me and Why. So uh, when Carrie asked me, would I be interested in giving a lecture for this series this semester, I immediately said yes, um, because I think it will be, or at the time I thought it would be a really interesting way to reach out and make some new connections with the campus community. And then of course, I began to think about what I would actually talk about. And when I, I'm, I'm a planner in advance, but I'm definitely a mental planner. So I like to think about something I'm going to do for quite a while before I actually sit down to write some slides, for example. So I decided to think about, you know, these two questions, what matters to me and why. Those are short questions, but they're really big. They're loaded questions. So I began to think about what is really important to me and how I could break that down into really just a few parts to share with you uh, this noon hour about what is important. So that's what I'm going to try to do at least in the next uh, 35 to 45 minutes. So the first thing you probably notice on my screen here that you see is that there are two languages up here. So uh, Del Shea told you that I'm from Ireland um, and being from Ireland, I also speak Irish. So this is the Irish language up here on your screen next to Ireland, or excuse me, next to English. Um, and you can see that it looks very different. It also sounds different. So if I translate what matters to me and why, it's August can't fall. So you can see and hear that it looks different and it definitely sounds very different to English. Now in Ireland, most people can speak Irish, of course. Um, it's considered the primary language, but practically speaking, English is the primary language of use. Most people grow up in an English speaking household and then they learn Irish second at school or through family or a combination. Um, a very small percentage of Irish people, unfortunately, learn Irish as their first language or are truly bilingual. Um, so I think it's just a, a piece when we talk about where we come from and you know the different skills that we have from our childhood, uh, language is one of those skills that's really important uh, that we need to think about and keep in mind. So even my name is very different in Irish. So if we look at what my name looks like, what's in my name, Kadathan Anam or Kadathan Ma Anam, what's my name? Uh, Ellen, of course, is not an Irish name. There's lots of different derivations of Ellen and spelling of Ellen, but Nivuel Kaha is my Irish name. So hopefully you can see my mouse here as I'm gonna point out some features. I added some arrows too to make it easier for this Zoom session. So Ni, N-I, and this little, this little flag up here uh, is called a fada, kind of looks like what you would see in a French word. Fada in Irish actually does mean long, so it, it's going to lengthen the vowel. So this is me. This means daughter of. So a lot of people are familiar with son of, so that would be O, like O Sullivan, or Mach, or Mac, which translates to son, like McConnell, McGrath, McCarthy. But me means daughter of. So I am Ellen daughter of Mwael Kaha, and Mwael Kaha is made up of two parts, Mwael, which means bald or bare or unprotected, and if you are a fan of Irish mythology, you may know this word already from Grania Whale, which in the 1500s was an Irish um, a warrior pirate princess. There's a lot of stories written about her, so um, some of that is probably exaggerated, and Kaha or Kahuk means warrior battlefield. So we can put all sorts of combinations in my name. And as children, when my brother and sister I, you know, talked about this, we thought it was really funny. To, uh, we called ourselves the bald-headed warriors. So, you know, it's interesting to think about names and where people come from. And for Irish people and lots of other countries and cultures, this is not by any means only Ireland, our names have changed over time. Um, some of you may know that a lot of Irish people have immigrated to the United States, to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, other countries all around the world. And a lot of times when people, particularly in the late 1800s and early 1900s, landed in that second country, their names were changed. Uh, the spelling of their names, the pronunciation of their names were changed. 
Um, and if you are lucky and any of that is written down, um, you can go back and trace and figure out what your original name was and maybe it's not the same name you have now. So names are important and it tells us a lot about the people we are. So um, a couple of photographs from my childhood to set the scene of what it's like to grow up in Ireland. Um, here I am in, in all these pictures of my childhood. Here I am with my sister in a really adorable school photograph. Uh, here I am with my sister and brother, my older sister, Sancha, who lives in Ireland right now. She lives and works in Cork. Of course, she's working at home right now. My younger brother, David, also living in Cork. So I'm the middle of three children. Here I am over here again with my sister, Sancha, and my grandmother. My grandmother owned and operated a dairy farm. My uncle still farms that land. Um, this picture is taken from the 1970s. And as children, uh, Sancha and David and I spent a lot of time on this farm. It was about 40 miles from where we lived, a lot of weekends and a lot of summers helping out at the farm, you know, just like the farm kids do as if we were, you know, living in that house right there. And no Irish childhood would be complete without one of two things, a picture of someone Irish dancing. This is me right here on the end, a little girl with the brown hair or a picture playing an Irish sport like hurling or Gaelic football, which I did not play. So I get to show the Irish dancing costume picture. Um, my sister and I, she's third in with some of our neighbors and, and schoolmates, um, Irish dancing. Uh, we did a lot of Irish dancing for years on Saturdays and Fridays after school. So if you've always wanted to learn how to Irish dance, now you know who to talk to. It's also very good exercise. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely see me. So a lot of people are really interested in Ireland um, and, and it's great to talk about and I, I could talk about Ireland for the whole hour, but I'm not going to. Um, but most questions about Ireland are, are really in the same vein. What is Ireland like? What it's like to be there? What it's like to grow up there? Is it really as green as it is in pictures? It is absolutely, it rains a lot. Um, you know, so called a era, what is Ireland? Um, so I'm just going to show you a few photographs to give you an understanding of the type of country that Ireland is, both geographically, it has stunning landscapes and really amazing um, natural beauty. So I'm going to show you a couple of photos. And also it's an, it has ancient civilizations. I mean, Ireland is an old country. Um, so in terms of the civilizations that have existed there over time, and a lot of those um, architectural and archaeological features that are important to our heritage are really meticulously maintained and have been beautifully restored. So I'm just going to show you a few for those of you listening or watching today. Um, so, you know, I'm sure some of you have been to Ireland, so maybe you have stories to share about each of those locations. Most of these photographs are taken by my sister. Uh, she is a pretty good amateur photographer and she goes out on her bike or walks a lot around where she lives out in the country and she takes a lot of photographs and, and sends them to me and shares them with me quite regularly. So almost all of these photographs are hers, apart from obvious ones, um, some of which are, of course are taken from, from the air. Um, so this is one of my favorite pictures of Ireland. This is Ireland by night. This is a, a NASA photograph. Um, and you can see, you know, that the shape is perfect, what it looks like when you see the map. Dublin is the capital here on the East Coast. It's the largest city, over 1 million people in the metropolitan area. And then Cork is the city down on the South Coast. That's the second largest city. That is where I'm from, outside Cork City. And then a couple of other big cities, Limerick, uh, Galway, and Belfast up here, and then Derry up here. So um, really beautiful picture that shows what Ireland looks like by night. So Ireland is a small country. So, you know, there's a lot of things that fit in there, but it's really pretty small. So Cavour is Cara. How actually big is Ireland? Um, it's about 70,000 square kilometers, about, you know, less than 30,000 square miles. So we're talking about a small place. Um, this is a map of the Republic of Ireland laid on top of a map of Kansas, a really neat website, overlapmaps.com. Um, my kids really like to look at this and put pieces of the world on top of each other to really show like how big things are. 
Uh, and Ireland is about a third of the size of Kansas. So we're talking about a small place. That's about 5 million people that live there. Um, compared to Kansas, which is just about under 3 million. So, you know, a small place, quite densely populated, small cities, one big city, but then also a lot of rural areas and farmland and agriculture, you know, similar to what we would be familiar with here in Kansas. So a couple of maps to orient ourselves geographically and politically. Uh, Ireland, of course, is what we're talking about. The Irish word for Ireland is actually era. So uh, that's what the word for Ireland is. Um, geographically, of course, we're on the western edge of Europe here, uh, where the, um, and Ireland is split into four provinces. So you can see here Ulster, Leinster, Munster, and Connacht. So four um, different provinces. Um, some of you, if you are English monarchy history fans, um, you probably know about this more than I do. But Connacht, um, <clears throat> to hell or to Connacht, is a phrase that's associated with Oliver Cromwell, who was Lord Protector of England um, in the 1600s. And uh, that referred to the fact that Connacht did not have a lot of really great farming land. So people were removed from their lands and were sent or really uh, removed and shipped off to Connacht. Uh, most of the really good farming land is down here in the middle, which is called the Golden Vale. Um, so if we look then at each of the four provinces, they're divided into counties. So there's 32 counties on the island of Ireland. Cork is the biggest right down here where I'm from. And each of those counties has its own local county government. And then elected officials uh, represent their constituents and they go to the government buildings in Dublin. And there are two houses of government in Ireland. Uh, the leader of the government is called the Taoiseach, which is the same as a prime minister. We do have a president, but that is not the political party leader. That's more of a figurehead for the state. Um, and then if we look at the political boundaries, we do have uh, you know, a political border in Ireland. The island of Ireland is uh, made up of the Republic of Ireland, which are these lighter green colors, these 26 counties, including Donegal up here. So this is the Republic of Ireland, which gained its independence in 1922. Um, after hundreds of years of colonization, um, really that began in, in the 12th century and probably beforehand uh, with the Anglo-Normans um, and the Saxons and then the Normans and then the British. Um, so that finally ended after a long period of time um, in the 1920s. Northern Ireland up here, these six counties up here in this tan color, Armagh, Down, Antrim, Derry, Tyrone, and Fermanagh, this is Northern Ireland and jurisdictionally and politically, Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. And we do have a border. Um, it has been an open border um, for, we'll say, you know, the last 20 years. Uh, as a child growing up in the south of Ireland in the 70s and, and the 60s before I was born, um, this, this really was more a closed border. So you did especially have to drive across the border to enter Northern Ireland. It's an open border now. Um, there is a lot of concern and discussion over what will happen to this border uh, because of the exit of um, Britain or England from the European Union, i.e. Brexit. So we will see what has to happen there. So Ireland is as green as they say. So another really cool website is aircode.ie. This can show you the location of any, really it's a zip code in Ireland. And this year, this red circle is the house where I grew up. So you can see you're surrounded by green fields and fields that have been plowed. So there's a lot of agriculture where I grew up, dairy farming and various crops. And this, our house uh, is on a small country road um, and we call it a lane. And this is the picture of the lane here. It's also called a boreen in Ireland, pretty narrow. It, they are paved because it's just simply too wet in Ireland not to have paved roads. And you can see some of the original stone walls or hedgerows are still on either side of the road. And there's some grass, patchy grass going down through the middle. This is about one to one and a half cars wide, keeping in mind that most European cars are smaller than American cars. So uh, it's kind of a one car at a time up the road for many places and you pull in if somebody shows up. Um, so this is the road where I grew up in the countryside uh, it's about eight miles from Cork City. So Cork City here 
is right here around Port Harbor. It's on the River Lee, which one is, is one of the bigger uh, rivers in Ireland, empties into Port Harbor and down here, of course, at the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so in, in terms of what Ireland looks like, I'm going to show you just a couple of pictures of some archeological and ancient civilization structures, just to give you a sense of um, you know, some other parts of Irish history and Irish heritage that Irish people are very proud of and that the, the government over the years has really done an awesome job about uh, restoring and, uh, and maintaining these sites. Just a few, there are really too many to show in this time span. And some of you may have already been here. This is Newgrange, Shian Roo. Uh, and this is in County Meath, which is the county next to Dublin on the East Coast. This is a Neolithic burial chamber, and it was constructed about 5,200 years ago based on archaeological estimation and analysis. And that puts it slightly older than Stonehenge and some of the great pyramids. Um, and it's really an amazing structure. There's an entryway here, and then there's a passageway into the middle, and then in the middle is a central burial chamber, and there are smaller burial features around the edge under that mound. And on one day a year, which is the winter solstice coming up on December 21st, if it's a sunny day in Ireland, and that's a big if, the sun enters through a portal or a hole over the doorway, lights up the passage, and then lights up the interior. So it's a, a, an architectural solar wonder. Um, it's really amazing uh, building and construction. So one, if you're lucky enough to be there because you have to put your name on a waiting list. Number two, if you're lucky enough that it's gonna be sunny, you will get to see that amazing, uh, amazing feature of Newgrange. Every other day of the year, you can go and you can see it will be simulated um, using lights. So if you get the opportunity, uh, definitely try to go to Newgrange. Um, another um, archeological feature that's found in Ireland but in many other countries too, in Europe and outside Europe, there's some examples of dolmens also in India and other countries. This is one of the more famous ones in Ireland called Paul Nebron. Um, and there are over 170 dolmens in Ireland. And again, these date um, back to the Neolithic period. And there's many fine examples in farmer's fields. This particular one um, is one of the more interesting ones as a re you know, really heavy limestone features with some carvings. Um, and these photographs were taken by my sister and I, so we really can't see those features. Um, and then there, this one is in the Burren, which is an unusual landscape that is entirely made up of limestone, very little soil, a really interesting place to, uh, place to visit if you're interested in looking at different landscapes and different formations from limestone. And then one more uh, prehistoric um, structure is Boon Angus. Loon is the Irish word for fort. Angus is a pre-Christian god. Uh, many pre-Christian gods have been described in Irish mythology. This is on the west coast of Ireland on the Aran Islands. So way out here um, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. And it, you, you're committed. You are absolutely committed if you want to see um, Loon Angus and the Aran Islands. You have to get to a little fishing village on the uh, on the edge there of, of the coastline, get on a small boat. Hopefully the water isn't too choppy and you won't be seasick. Uh, you'll definitely get wet even if it's not windy. And then once you get to the Aran Islands, this is on one of the Aran Islands, you can walk or rent a bike and uh, spend quite a bit of time going over some big hills to get up to Dunangus. So once you get to here, you have definitely deserved this view. Um, so this was built during the Bronze Age. Um, and it has, from an aerial view, you'd be able to see circles of stone walls. And you can see some, you know, here close in the foreground, some more stone walls. And it was built right up on the cliff face. This is me. Obviously, I was feeling really brave because um, it's always windy out there. So you would get down on your hands and knees and then you would shimmy out probably best on your tummy because it's really uh, windy and not very safe to be on the edge of these cliffs. But it's a spectacular view from the west of Ireland and next stop here would of course be uh, America. So some more images of Ireland. Um, if you're lucky, it's gonna be sunny like this. Um, and but more often it's gonna be really windy like this or windy and rainy. 
Cork, um, Cork down here on the south coast has beautiful beaches. This is where this is taken. This is a beach where I spent many summers um, during my childhood. I use the term summer loosely. It doesn't mean it was sunny. It just means it was June and July. Um, we went anyway. Um, and then this is a, a beach on the, on the east coast in County Dublin. And this is taken in County Kerry down here um, on the southeast coast of Ireland where there are amazing peninsula. And if you are a surfer or you like to sail or boat or canoe, um, this is definitely the place for you. So two more pictures, um, more recent photographs of my children and I in Ireland. This is Gwynedd Castle, which is a really nicely maintained castle in County Cork. This is only about three miles from where I grew up. So I've been there several times. Really great place to visit, very popular on the tourist trail. This is another beach in County Dublin, north of where the last photograph was taken. This is a rocky beach. So Ireland has both you know, rocky, pebble, and sandy beaches. And this is looking out to the east. Um, so next stop over here would be the coast of England. So a lot of people, you know, we talk about Ireland and what it's like, and that just gives you a really quick feel for what a, a beautiful country it is. And so the next question is, if someone is brave, uh, and of course I welcome those questions too, um, is why did I leave Ireland? You know, that's a fair question. Why do people leave where they're born? Um, why did they leave their family, go to another country, um, to something new and unexpected and unanticipated? And what does that journey look like? Um, when, when I was in school and in college in Ireland, you know, we have a great educational system. Um, as I was leaving college, the Irish economy was really improving along with the rest of Europe. So it definitely wasn't a country that I had to leave, unlike maybe um, many generations before where people did leave Ireland because of the economy and to leave and seek a better life for themselves and their family. Um, so how did I get from Cork to Kansas? This is really my educational pathway it took me from Ireland to the United States. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that educational pathway looks like um, and thinking about why people leave their home to seek education elsewhere. And, you know, thinking about our students, our undergraduate and graduate students leaving their home, wherever it may be, coming to Manhattan, Kansas, and all the hurdles they have to jump and all of the things they have to do, which are not easy. So I always um, am grateful that I have been on that journey. So I definitely understand what it's like to have to leave your family, go somewhere else, um, you know, whole new country um, and figure out what to do uh, for, my, for my education. So I did go to undergraduate um, uh, college in Ireland. I went to University College Cork as a teenager, I really was interested in science and biology and chemistry were my favorite subjects and my favorite teachers in school. So I went to University College Cork, UCC, uh, which is in Cork City. And um, it is a public state institution. There are several really great uh, public state universities in Ireland. And I uh, worked on a degree in microbiology. So I graduated with a bachelor's degree in microbiology from University College Cork. Here I am on my graduation day with my mom and my grandmother. Uh, both of these ladies up here are also called Ellen. Uh, Ellen is a family name. My daughter is also called Ellen. There are 10 Ellens in our family back um, nine generations. In one generation, there were two Ellens. That's a long line of Ellens and nothing like a, a little bit of familial pressure there to name your children a certain name. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a really cool thing. So I graduated from UCC and I took a year off, which, um, which I, is a great idea then, it's a great idea now. I, I worked, I traveled a little bit. Um, I worked in Germany for most of the time. So I brushed up my German, uh, which probably needs more brushing up and then traveled in different European countries um, and worked a little bit along the way. During that year, somehow I found time to study for the GRE which was not required for graduate school in, in Ireland, of course, but it's required here um, and also applied to graduate school. So it was a really interesting year and a year from there, so this was May and this is a, a year from after this, from August, I went to Nebraska. So I started graduate school at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. 
and I worked in the lab with Dr. Richard Besson, and we worked on prion diseases. So I worked on a model of protein conformation um, and protein change of the prion protein. And I loved graduate school. Um, I loved everything about it. I loved working in the lab, the experiments, the analysis, asking the questions, trying to figure out the answer. Um, I, I really enjoyed my time at Creighton University. Um, so I graduated with a PhD in microbiology um, and immunology from the Department of Micro and Immunology. And, um, and, that, and then I moved to Kansas. So this is why, this is how I ended up in Kansas. So um, I moved to Kansas and I had my eye on public health. So this is really the first time that my, my journey has shifted a little bit you know, uh, science as a teenager, bachelor's of science, PhD in microbiology, that's a, a pretty straight shot. Um, that's a, you know, a typical route, no deviation really. But I began to verge off and, and, and look at public health. So, um, and I was really interested in, in trying to, you know, figure out a way to combine my interest in public health at the beginning of my MPH with my training and my interest in microbiology. So I started an MPH at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, and once again, just like my PhD program, I really enjoyed it. And I really branched out and, and took a lot of different courses that I hadn't formally taken before. Um, I took courses in social and behavioral health, environmental health, cultural competency, um, chronic diseases such as you know, I took classes about cancer and the impacts of tobacco. So I really learned a lot of information that I had not previously learned because of course I'd been so focused on infectious diseases and microbiology for so long. And the project I ended up working on was with um, refugee resettlement agencies in the Kansas City metro area. And I helped them with their health education and health promotion programs for women refugees. And I really enjoyed this work. Um, I worked with a group of uh, researchers at KU Nursing School, and it was um, satisfying and challenging and stimulating everything that an MPH project should be. And this really put me on a path to public health to where I am today. So I began to, you know, as most people do when they think they might need a new job or they look for a new job, I began to keep my eye out for I really wanted a job that put all of this together. So of course, like a lot of graduate students, you know, I'm, I'm not only in school, I'm also working. Um, so at the time I was teaching, I had taken up a teaching position. I was finishing up my postdoc in the lab, finishing up my MPH program. Um, uh, having babies, and you can see in this picture, this picture here, I'm teaching, I'm pregnant. Uh, this was my uh, third child, Danica, who's my youngest. So I was doing a lot of different things at the same time. And you know what? A lot of our graduate students are and our undergraduate students. They're working, they have family commitments, they have full-time jobs, part-time jobs, um, and then working through their program, working through their projects, writing papers. Um, university, college classes, all of that is busy, it's hard, it's a challenge. Um, so I, I keep that in mind all the time about how I felt in some of these pictures. I was busy, uh, pregnant some of the time, um, you know, uh, working hard, writing up my project, um, and, and, but loving it all. So this is, this is how I made my way to Case State. So I, I was really looking for a position that would allow me to bring in my public health interest, my background in training in microbiology, and my, 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 my real passion and love for teaching and helping students. And that is what I found at K-State. So my next stop was K-State. Um, so I moved to K-State to Manhattan, Kansas in 2016 to take up the position that I have now. So um, as Del Shea mentioned, I'm the director of the Master of Public Health Program and faculty member in the College of Veterinary Medicine. And these two parts of my job allow me to put all of those things together, public health, microbiology, graduate education, teaching. So I can you know, use all my skills, all my training and put that to good use for the, you know, for the future generations of our students. And that's exactly where I want to be. So, Next, I'm going to talk about 
what I actually do at Case State. So um, here, here on campus at Case State, when I arrived, the MPH program was already in excellent shape, um, you know, really nicely organized, great faculty, great staff, great students. So I'm really thankful uh, that I came in and this program was ready and, and I was able to, to go with it and, and keep going and working to make it better. Um, so I work with really great staff and faculty at the College of Veterinary Medicine and my department and across campus. Um, we are an interdisciplinary program. So we really need all the help from different departments, staff members, faculty members uh, to make this program truly successful. And in the MPH program office, um, I have a program advisor, uh, Mrs. Barta Stevenson. And if you know Barta, she's awesome. She's a rock star and I really enjoy working with her. And she and I are really on the same page. We're focused on our students. We're focused on making our program as good as it can be. So what are we really focused on? Um, of course, we're focused on our students and this is obvious because it should be obvious that this is our most important process in our office. We're focused on making sure our students really are going to be prepared as best they can when they make their way into the workplace or they're doing this program because they want to move up in their workplace. They're looking for career promotion, career advancement or a change in their career. That's their focus, so that's our focus. We really pay attention to both courses and skills that are needed there for, for their career. Um, you know, we have very specific coursework, very specific requirements for our program, but also we need to think about what skills that may not be in their courses or may need to be in their courses in the future, what are they going to need for their career to be successful. So really we spend a lot of time thinking about this, working on this. We also look at time to graduation and, and helping them uh, with employment processes. So, you know, someone who is working full time, you know, needs to take a class, needs to move through the program as slow or as fast as they want. That is definitely something we keep our eye on. Someone who's a full time student who's already come out of undergraduate and they want to be in the workforce in two years, we work hard on that. So, an MPH is a 42 hour degree. You can complete it in five to six semesters or two years. So we work really carefully with our students to make sure we're going to move through and plan all of this to make sure that they can get out into the workforce. And that's really important for us. We want our students to be successful. We want them to take the skills they have learned in graduate school and undergraduate before that and move out into the workforce, into the world and make public health better. Um, and that, that is ultimately our goal. And along the way, we, we also want to make it easier um, as much as we can. You know, when I think about graduate school and those of you in graduate school right now or who have been there in the past, when I look back, I, I don't really remember the forms and the paperwork and the red tape and all of the hurdles I had to jump over and hoops jump through, um, but they were there. Um, so, and, and the reason I don't remember them so much is because, you know, the where I was before, the graduate schools where I was before, there was a great staff group, you know, really great people to help me. And I, I, that is how I want our program to be. I want our students to have all the help they need with whatever it is, you know, I, I think Bart and I say all the time, as many times as we can, ask us, we will help. We want to listen to our students and we do because we want to make it better. They have, they have the great suggestions. Our students come and say, have you thought about this? Or why don't you try this? And that's what we're gonna do because they always are thinking about it. They are there in the time. So I'm going to listen to what they are experiencing. And of course, ultimately then that goes back to improving the process. You know, graduate school, um, there's a lot going on. Our students are working hard in many different areas of their life. So we want to improve the process as much as possible. So really that is, you know, my focus on making sure our students have everything they need. So that's really the, the, the biggest part of my job essentially. The next big part of my job is working with our partners. So we have really great um, partners in public health for training our students. Um, we work with a lot of local health departments here in Kansas and across the country, including, of course, our own local health department, Riley County Health Department, and our director, um, Ms. Julie Gibbs. So we work really closely with Riley County. 
and other health departments regionally um, for our training of our students. All public health students at the graduate level are required to do a public health practice um, experience. So how are, so they're working with an agency, learning how does public health work? What is a public health agency? What is public health practice? What does it mean to be a public health practitioner? So our partners in public health are essential for this you know, pretty big part of our, our degree program. We also work with several public health workforce agencies including uh, KDAG, Kansas Department of Health and the Environment, which is our state public health agency in Topeka. Um, and they also have been really great partners, have had several of our students over the years for their uh, public health practice projects. Um, and they do a really nice job of training our students. And then different, various other different types of public health agencies. There are so many different opportunities out there for our students to work in public health and to be trained in public health. And th this goes two ways, you know, our partners in public health, we rely on them to provide training opportunities for our students, mentors who will guide our students and, and teach and show them what public health practice actually is. But then the opposite is also important, the faculty and the students um, at K-State, we have our skills and our expectations and, and our experiences and our strengths, and we can bring this with the student to their place of practice. So we can help the public health agency with something they need, a project, a skill, something that they would like help with. So this is a really important relationship and is something that um, I enjoy working with all of our public health partners out in the state of Kansas and, and regionally and nationally and internationally. Our students have also had really interesting um, international opportunities to see what public health looks like in other countries. So the next part, what I'm going to talk about for the last few minutes here is looking forward. Um, and this is for all of us. I think us collectively as a community, uh, as a, a university campus, a town, a county, a state, um, our country, we need to be thinking about what public health is looking like now and what it's going to look like in the future and, and what our needs are. We really need to understand the cornerstones of public health and, and the, the pillars of public health, you know, ha have been laid out very carefully and, and worked upon in our coursework and out in public health practice for several years. Um, you know, and these have not changed for hundreds of years you know, epidemiology, uh, biostatistics, environmental health, healthcare administration, and social and behavioral health. These are all very important content areas that our students learn and they need, and every public health student in the country and internationally is going to learn these core areas. But we also need to understand the determinants of health or the determinants of public health, because here we're talking about the population level. So this, this is in addition to those core areas. And what do I mean by this? What determines our population health? What determines your health or my health, the health of our families? And these are you know, more difficult infrastructural considerations of our community and how our system of health is built in this country or in other countries, you know, and, and uh, Carrie talked about it at the very beginning, when we're talking about difficult topics such as discrimination, inequity, violence, disparities, uh, racial injustice, these are all major parts of what determines our population health. And they're not only determinants or contributors, we really have to see them and think about them and tackle them as root causes of health disparities and inequities in our country today. So our students learn about this, and then we are going to make sure from our side, in terms of the education side and the public health practice side, that our public health workforce understands what this means, what are the determinants of health and how it impacts our population health. And then two other skills that are really crucial, we see it right now this year particularly, and we've seen this, you know, for several years. This is not unique to public health. Communication and leadership are skills um, for engagement and trust and community building that we all need and all our students need to learn to move forward into their communities. Communication is essential 
And, and we need both sides of this. We need the ability, the skill, the strategies to communicate with lots of different audiences. And we also need to understand why. Why do we need all these different skills? Why are our communities and our audiences so diverse in their need to be able to consume communication? This is really crucial for students moving out into the world of public health. Leadership essential. No one of these are more important than the others. We really have to continue to step up and push forward both in public health and every other program that we offer at this university. We need to use the platform, whatever platform we have. We all have our sphere of influence, our friends, our family, our colleagues, our teachers, our students, our community. And we need to use that sphere of influence to be able to really engage in our communities at whatever level we feel comfortable, build trust in our communities, and really talk about these really big issues of our time. Um, we, we have to be able to struggle with this, you know, take these challenges and they're difficult ones to figure out how we're going to take public health as we see it today, you know, today, this year, um, today in our generation and move it forward because ultimately we're going to have to do that to tackle um, those big serious det uh, determinants of our health and health care um, and population health in our country. So last thoughts here. Um, I urge you all to use your platform, whatever your platform looks like. Um, I think it's really important that we all use the platform we have to, in terms of speaking out for public health, speaking out for the importance of public health. Um, I also think we need to call out discrimination and inequity when we see it. Uh, not everybody feels comfortable doing this. It's not always easy to do, but we all have that platform or that sphere of influence that we can use. Um, at the very least, we should be talking about it and trying to understand why discrimination and inequity and disparity impacts our health so much. And the next level, you know, that next level is talking about it to be teaching and brainstorming and figuring out these, these really big important issues. Um, I'm going to use my platform today because I'm talking to you for the last two points. Um, it's October, it's the last week before the presidential election in the United States. So it's really important to be part of the voting and political process. And to be thinking not just this election, but all election cycles, thinking about our elected officials, what policies are going to be put in place or what policies are going to be changed and thinking about how our health and education and our human rights are going to be protected. And of course, my public health advocate in me is definitely going to use this platform to encourage you and urge you to get your flu shot and your family members, particularly young children and elderly adults in your family if you have not already done so. So I, I have to talk about the flu shot, particularly in October. So I'm going to finish up, uh, uh, try, try to um, move past the, the more challenging and difficult issues that I just talked about and talk about where we are this year. We have all adapted. Goodness, we've adapted so many different ways and how we teach and how we live and how we get our groceries. Um, all of those we've adapted and we've done really well. I think everybody needs to you know, recognize that everyone has done a great job and is doing the best they can. And the best they can is really great. Um, my household has certainly adapted. Um, of course, children are not in school all the time, depending on where you live. So any given day in my household, I could have one of my three children or one of my two cats on my desk. Um, and one of my cats really likes my desk chair. It's probably really cozy. So we compromised. And of course I compromised because I'm, I'm an absolute cat lover, feline fan. So I put a desk net, I put a chair next to my desk with a nice cozy purple blanket. You can probably see a little wildcat sticking out. So we have compromised on where the cat can sit. Um, so thank you again um, for sharing some of your time with me today to, to listen to what matters to me and why. Uh, these are photographs uh, taken of beautiful Kansas. Kansas has amazing landscapes. If you did not get the opportunity this year to get out, um, you definitely should. These two are pretty close to Manhattan here. This is on the Kanza Prairie where we go a lot, but we went really more than usual this summer. 
This photograph here in the middle of the stunning sunset was only about a month ago. This is taken at top of the world here in Manhattan, a really nice park to walk around in. And these two parks over here, yes, this is Kansas. For those of you who have been here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who have not been here, this is in Western Kansas. It's on 83 Highway, which is south of Oakley. If you have not been here before, there are several amazing rock monuments and structures around Oakley and Scott City um, that are well worth the trip. You need to get up really early and head out. And if you do, there's a, a really great coffee shop in Oakley where you will be rewarded with good coffee. So thank you very much for uh, your time. And I will be happy to answer any questions now. I'm gonna stop sharing and go back to our, our participant views. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ellen. At this time, if you have a question and would like to open up your video or your mic, you can um, kind of raise your hand either with one of the reactions or on the participants. You're also welcome to write a question in the chat and Andrea and I will do our best to make sure that all the questions are, are asked. So Ellen, um, Bonnie, has, uh, Bonnie Rush has a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see it, but I'll read it aloud for you. Um, oh, maybe this is a great comment. Can you read that, Ellen? Uh, yeah, let me open the chat. Yep. Okay. All right. But um, Bonnie's commenting um, to you, Ellen, that um, she wants everyone to understand your efficiency and work ethic and how you seamlessly manage the MPH program, single parenting three children and make it look easy. Um, you're a strong student advocate and mentor in changing lives. So um, uh, acknowledgement to you, Ellen, for your hard work. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, Kayla has a question. Could you talk about the difference between public health and global health? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> when we talk about public health, we're really referring to population health. So that can be, you know, ch choose any sphere of population you, you're interested in. We could talk about the state level, we could talk about the county level, um, national, international, uh, regional, you know, a good example right now, because we're in a, a pandemic, which is an international um, public health event, but it's also a global health event, you know, we could talk about population health in terms of differences between um, strategies between different states. So that's a public health or a population health level question. You know, what is Kansas doing in comparison to Missouri? What is the United States doing in, in comparison to Canada? So if we choose a different example, if we look at vaccination, so what are vaccination recommendations in the United States versus a country in Europe? They're going to be similar, but there, there, there will be differences. So that's what we talk about when we talk about public health, that, that's going to transcend, um, you know, talking about a specific part of the world. When we talk about global health, you know, then we're really referring to international components of public health, or you could, you could do it the reverse. You could say, what are public health components of global health? So you, you can put them together. You could, you know, they're not completely synonymous, but I think you can overlap them. And, and I see in, in the question there about global experiences, yes, several of our students have gone to other countries and worked on their public health project with agencies in other countries, which is an amazing experience. Yeah, great question. And yes, yay cats, I love cats. <laughs> If you would like to take a few of the other questions from the chat, if you can see those. Sure. Um, how do I, the next one from Lydia oh. is, oh. Yeah, um, Lydia asks, uh, how, how do you handle um, family gatherings with so many Ellens? Right, that's a great question. Um, I suppose it's in context, like anything else. Um, and um, my daughter and I, are, our names are spelled E-L-L-Y-N. My mother and grandmother and everyone before them were E-N. Uh, my mother changed my name because she didn't want me to be called Nell or Eileen or other variations of Ellen in Ireland. So I, I suppose we just, um, we just uh, context is important, but also since I've been alive, there's never been more than unfortunately uh, three generations alive at the same time. So my grandmother passed away when I was pregnant with Ellen and I was not, uh, my great grandmother was not alive when I was born. So I suppose right now we can manage three. <laughs> 
Um, we have several questions that uh, folks are curious about kind of comparing um, some of the like political systems and, and public health systems between the US and, and Ireland. Um, so Justin asks, since you grew up in another country and first knew a different political system, um, how, how might you compare or contrast the election systems? Right. Um, you know, the, the election system is not too different. So we, we have a, a local representative um, in your area. So your county is divided into different areas, just like your state would be divided into different areas. So I think if you see a county in Ireland, like a state in the United States, so you would vote for your um, your, your choice of elected representative, and then um, those then will get tallied per um, political party, and then whoever has the majority for political party, they will be then, it's first kind of similar to Britain, they will be asked to form a party by the president, but that's only a figurehead, really. Um, we have more than two parties in Ireland. We're not a two-party system. We have two major parties, Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael, but we also have independent parties, a Labour party, uh, a Green party. So we're not a two-party system. And those other parties are pretty well represented in the Irish government. They would not be considered, you know, very minimal or fringe representation. So, you know, some election cycles, a government will have to form a coalition to form a whole government. So there are requirements about how many seats, kind of like here, are necessary to be the actual winner of an election. But the, the person with the most votes can ask a second party to join a coalition to form the government. So that's similar in other countries. It's similar in Britain, um, in England, um, New Zealand, seeing as their election was just in the media, in the news, and New Zealand is similar also in some other countries, Australia, right? So, so some things are different, others not. Yeah. Ellen, this feels like a, a relevant question. Um, could you share a little bit about what K-State and maybe you and your co colleagues are doing in this pandemic moment um, around protecting people's health and trying to resolve the science-based issues related to um, COVID? Right, that's a great question. So yes, there are a lot of faculty members and their students working in labs on campus, um, working on various aspects of COVID-19. Uh, so there's really a lot of excellent research taking place. Um, there's also, of course, testing taking place, uh, the veterinary diagnostic lab um, over in the veterinary college. So there's a lot of testing going on right there with, with really amazing uh, turnaround time. So they're doing a great job over there. And then a lot of our students are working as contact tracers, not only in Kansas, but in Missouri, um, and, and other places around the country, depending on where they're living or where they've moved to over the summer. So a lot of our current students are either working or volunteering as contact tracers. And we've got also quite a lot of alumni graduates out there working in various positions in local health departments, like state health departments like Topeka and Tennessee and, and other states. And, and they're really on the front lines in terms of the testing, uh, the epidemiology, surveillance, uh, contact tracing, but also thinking about, you know, at, at, a, at a state level like Kansas um, or Missouri, where we have also um, some alumni working at the state levels. Uh, they're doing a lot of work, and that literally is at the front lines of public health. Yeah, so great question. Yeah. I want to pause and just acknowledge that we're at our one o'clock time boundary. So if folks um, need to leave, uh, you, you're welcome to do that. And Ellen, we want to thank you. But Ellen, would you be available for maybe five more minutes to answer a few sure. questions if folks want to stay on? Okay, sure, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you all again for attending. And I hope you can join us at our um, at our next session uh, with Dr. Greg Eisline and team um, in just a couple weeks. So again, thank you so much, Ellen. Um, one of the one of the questions that came up on the chat was, um, were you, let's see, where did that go? Were you in your educational pursuits when the mad cow disease broke out in the UK? And how did this inspire your study of prions? And how did you perceive the president? And how do you perceive the present pandemic influencing students now? So it's a com complex question, but yes. uh, some curiosities from from the audience. That's a great question and the answer is yes to both. So I was in um, UCC in the 90s 
Um, and so I, I lived through that whole mad cow um, epidemic, which mostly impacted Britain, but also impacted a lot of farmers in Ireland. Um, and of course, I'm you know living in the country and, and pretty much grew up in a farming family. So it was a, a big deal in Ireland and also, of course, a very important uh, for animal health in Europe. Um, and, you know, it was really interesting because one of my lecturers at the time was one of the Irish representatives to the one of the EU advisory boards for prion diseases. So he would come back from his meetings and talk about and tell us what they talked about in the policy and, and the things that they were putting in place. And, and this is so influential to a student to hear in, in real life time an emerging disease, what's going on, this is brand new. You know, literally we're, we're learning as we go. You know what I mean? We're trying to figure it out as we go along. The science changes, new data is gathered, and then we have to share that with the public. And that's exactly what we've seen today. You know, it, it also is, you know, we've seen this, you know, when the first SARS epidemic, every time we have a, a really a new type of influenza and several other diseases, Ebola, uh, West Nile virus, there's countless examples of this. So I think it's very influential to students. I think that's a great question. Someone right now who is thinking about, wow, you know, I like science, but I'm not sure what I want to do. They may look at COVID-19 and they may think about viruses and surveillance and technology. They also may think about the policy side and how our political system and maybe or not maybe is impacting uh, what our response is looking like. So I think it is, is definitely influential to our students right now. Absolutely. Great question. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. Can we ask that's, thank you. that's thank you in Irish. <laughs> Can we ask her key? Oh, that's awesome. Carmel said she's from Cork. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, uh, did you did you always have the desire to study in the U.S. and where did that desire come from? So that's a good question. Um, you know, university is this great universities in Ireland, and obviously I went to undergraduate there. Um, and I I really did want to study prion diseases. So and I had kind of made up my mind in the latter part of my third year before I started fourth year in college. Um, and so I did look around, you know, where are there some prion labs in the world, because at the time there really weren't very many, so I didn't have a lot of choices, um, but I did want to go somewhere else, so I was born in Cork, raised in Cork, went to college in Cork, so I did want to go somewhere different, but yeah, Nebraska was definitely a, a different location. So, uh, you know, when, when I was choosing programs, you know, you don't necessarily choose the city, or at least maybe you shouldn't. So I was really choosing the program. So that's how I ended up in Nebraska to work with Dr. Resson. And I think the final question in the chat um, from Dan says, what happened to your accent? When you go back home, do you find that it comes out more and does it startle your kids? Yes, that's Yes, and yes. So yeah, my accent has definitely waned over the years. So if you think about it, I've lived now in the Midwest for 20 years. This year, actually, I finally went over more years not in Ireland than in Ireland, which is kind of sad. Um, but so my accent definitely has evened out. And you know, the Midwest accent is, is pretty neutral in comparison to a lot of other American accents. So it's very easy to pick up. Um, but it does come back immediately. It comes back when I'm on the phone. Uh, anytime I'm talking to my mom or my sister, um, it comes back instantly if I'm around Irish people. My children actually, the opposite, they, they really don't notice it. They're used to me having two different voices. They would call this my teaching voice. That's what my children call this voice. Um, so they're kind of used to that and they're used to, you know, different words. So they really, I, I tell them they have an advantage because they can speak two different types of English because they understand English in two different countries. So that's a great question. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, any additional uh, final questions? All right, again, thank, 
Thank you so much. This was truly wonderful and just a wonderful way to kick off our uh, fall series. And again, uh, thank you to all who uh, attended and participated. And we will have the video of this available on um, the What Matters to Me and Why webpage. So please feel free to share it with others who might not have been able to attend today or watch again if you'd like to. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Andrea.